Hello and welcome to another edition of GNET TV News Projects in Studio. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director here at GNET TV. It's my pleasure to be here with uh, three gentlemen who are involved in the uh, Solar Fest that will be coming to the uh, Southern Vermont Arts Center later this summer, but also in an Energy Savings Day scheduled for March 25th, only a, a couple of weeks away, that uh, will be a, a lead up to that. And uh, it's great to have. Uh, these three folks here with us today. First off, we have Bima Nida, of yes. the, who's the president of the Power Group of North Bennington. Uh, Bill LaBerge, who's the solar king of Bennington County, as far as we know. And Alan Benoit, who also has been uh, very active in sustainable design and, and sustainable uh, talks uh, that he's been giving at the North Shore Bookstore over the years. So, gentlemen, uh, Bill, uh, get us started here. What, what's going to be going on on this event on... March 25th, what, uh, what's the overview of that? Well, so what we're doing is um, Solar Fest is, is establishing a presence now with the help of Southern Vermont Art Center. And, and what, they, what the two groups really want to do is make it into not just a once a year event. Typically, Solar Fest has happened in the last weekend of July and you know, for 23 years it's been doing that. Now what we're doing is we're, we're transitioning to uh, making it a year-long series of educational opportunities. So, uh, so Energy Savings Day will be on March 25th. And, and what it's going to be is sort of a microcosm of what you might learn at, so, at the full-blown Solar Fest. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have um, at, at 10 o'clock there'll be uh, someone from the uh, Building Performance Professionals Association is going to be there to talk about net zero energy homes. Uh, and, and so part of our mission is to really help people to get their homes to be net zero energy, uh, where you can, your house can actually produce more energy than it uses. Uh, so, so there'll be a, a discussion about that whole concept, and, uh, and, and it'll be a pretty good uh, dive into it from, from the building professionals. Then we're going to split up the day into two discussions with, with panels. Uh, in the morning after that keynote discussion is going to be a panel that's going to talk about conservation. Um, so, so what we really want to do is, is help people to explain uh, with our panel how, as you're building a house, what should you keep in mind? You know, e even if you've got your house built and you're retrofitting, how do you save energy? Um, and then um, there'll be some discussion about financing opportunities as well. Then in the afternoon, we're going to be switching over to then the generation of the energy. So there'll be discussion of photovoltaics, wind, uh, community solar, storage, uh, and then throughout the day, there'll be a bunch of vendors, you know, that people can visit their tables and get information from. And there'll be a lot of opportunity for question and answers so that people can get really specific answers to, um, you know, we're, we're basically trying to educate everybody that this is a very doable process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, since in the nine months or so that's gone by since the last Solar Fest, uh, that was the first one at the Art Center, um, it's been a lot of talk about solar and about renewable energy. Uh, it's, it's continuing to be an important topic. Uh, I guess I just wondered, uh, what has been the big change since then, if, if, if any, uh, that has occurred within the solar, solar industry? Well, yeah, I think uh, several things have been going on. Solar PV prices have been dropping dramatically. Okay. You know, when we first started installing, what, 10 years ago, we were installing PV panels for about $2.50 a watt. Now they're down to about 50 cents a watt. So, wow. and I, I'm sure your viewers are familiar with Moore's law mm -hmm. in, uh, right. with uh, laptops and PCs. Every 18 the analog, months, the, uh, exactly, the memory yep. doubles or whatever. Right. So the analog of Moore's law is a Swanson effect in solar. With every doubling of capacity, the PV panel price has dropped by about 20%. So that's been pretty consistent in the last uh, 10 years or so. So what we've been seeing is not only panels becoming more and more efficient, but they're dropping in prices as well. So uh, that's, that's one big development in the last uh, several years. So that must be uh, putting a lot of pressure, I guess, uh, or, or at least making, making the cost way more competitive than with, with traditional forms of energy like oil and absolutely. perhaps even natural gas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was just saying, you know, once again, going back 10 years ago, we were doing roof mount installs for the total installed cost was about $6 a watt. Mm -hmm. Now it's 50% of that. So what's driving that, that change? I mean, what, 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 what has large, happened to make, uh, make it so much less expensive than it used to be? A large part of that was uh, in the late uh, 2000s the Chinese government started providing massive subsidies to their 
to the local domestic manufacturers to ramp up production and be part of the uh, uh, you know the renewables industry. And uh, as you recall, there was this uh, a slowdown in manufacturing and recession all over the kind of, all over the world in late 2007 2008 time frame. So there was a lot of capacity built up in that time. And uh, what you're seeing is sort of a, the wave effect of that, of the capacity being used to generate more and more uh, PV uh, panels and the capacity now slowly being absorbed as demand picks up in different parts of the mm -hmm. world. But as, as that went on in the late, uh, I think 2012, 13 or so, uh, manufacturing also started uh, building up. And uh, you know the uh, process, the manufacturing processes started getting more and more efficient. And so panel prices kept dropping. Mm. So uh, has that translated into like more and more installations? And uh, I would think that, that with the cost going down, you have that, that makes a, a solar array more financially attractive, not only to businesses, but also to private homeowners as well. Are we seeing a steady growth in that? Definitely. I can say that from, my, from our perspective, we've been seeing a, you know, an exponential increase in uh, interest in solar. We've been doing off-grid solar, grid tide, a community solar, everything in the last 10 years, and uh, the interest has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I can say that I'm sure that uh, Bill would, Bill would uh, confirm that as well. Yeah, and, and a lot of the, the industry, the growth of the industry is also tied in with all the, uh, the incentives. So they just extended the 30% the federal tax credit mm -hmm. uh, that for, for renewable energy. Uh, there was some, you know, a little bit of uh, nervousness about whether that was going to go away. That got extended. So you're starting to see, you know, people feeling comfortable with that. Now they're wondering if it might be taken away. So all of a sudden there's an urgency with people. Uh, and then Vermont still has a, a pretty strong net metering program. Uh, that has started to be a little bit less, uh, you know, it gets a little bit less each time they, they renew the rules. Um, but it's still pretty strong. So... Uh, it's, it's a great, there's still great incentives for people to do it. Alan, I was wondering, all of this must tie into Vermont's plan or, or hope or whatever for being, uh, let's see, 90% reliant on renewable energy by the year 2050, 2050. which still is like 30 plus years away, but I guess <laughs> it's going to be coming sooner than we think. How, how does all of this fit in with uh, uh, designing a home that's sustainable? Yeah, it's it's all actually coming together nicely, uh, especially in the last five years or so. Now that you know PV prices, as BMO was talking about, have dropped, um, and we have good uh, construction techniques for for making a house nice and tight now. So it's kind of a combination of energy efficiency, the tightness of the house, the the design of the house, and the affordability of the solar panels. So I think of the last seven houses I've done. Five of them are or can easily be net zero, so uh, and two of them are actually net positive. So uh, it's it's something that I didn't know I'd see in my lifetime. I was hopeful <laughs> for, um, but it really has uh, all come together recently. It all seems to be uh, coming along much faster, as you, as you say, than, than I, I think a lot of us might have thought 10 years ago uh, mm -hmm. when it seemed like we were still kind of stuck in, you know, uh, it was like a very very slow march to right. to that uh, that that destination um, um, I mean is, is there bill mentioned something about the tax credits there and I just I just wondered uh, you know we have a new administration in Washington which may or may not be as you know fascinated with renewable energy and solar as the, the previous administration um, do, is there any concern that uh, some of these tax credits might you know go away and, and if so would that really kind of put the brakes on some of this progress can I address? Sure. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things. One, the biggest thing is that the there are now more people employed in the solar industry than coal, natural gas, and oil power generation combined. And uh, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, we didn't really have a huge uh, uh, presence uh, in uh, Washington, but now there's a pretty sizable lobby up there for the solar industry. So. Uh, the, there is some pressure to uh, ensure that the tax credit would continue. There are a couple of things that are going in its favor. One is that the tax credit is set to expire by itself. It will start sunsetting in 2020. By 2021, it will drop to about uh, 
25 percent. 26, yeah. Yep. And, then, and, then 20. and 2022 it'll drop to 10 percent. So after that it'll go away. So uh, it's somewhat unlikely that uh, you know there would be any pushback on that since it's designed to sunset anyway. Uh, regardless, uh, if there were a concern that uh, the tax credit would be uh, brought up by Congress as something to be addressed, uh, there is a possibility that uh, the industry, the solar industry, would push back on that and say that okay, you know, worst case, let's try to let's uh, uh, you know make sure that uh, it complies with Buy America. So if you know, it might be that you might end up buying solar panels which are made in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Which I guess wouldn't be a horrible thing. Right. right. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the president would think that that would be probably a great idea. But uh, how 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 uncompetitive then is is the U.S. solar manufacturing industry? I mean, you, you mentioned that the the Chinese were at the forefront of of uh, bringing in cheaper panels. It became the whole. It really sounded like a game changer. I mean, are there are there companies here in the states that are able to kind of absolutely jump yeah, in? there are several companies. Uh, builds, uh, installs sun power modules, right? Sun power is a great company. Uh, we do Solar Worlds, which mm -hmm. is a very large company based out of Oregon. And uh, so, yeah, there is quite a bit of domestic uh, manufacturing which can step in. The thing that's happening is that uh, solar panels, like uh, many other commodities, it is becoming a bit of a commodity business. So, regardless of where you are, ma where they're manufactured, all anywhere in the world there will be downward pressure on panel pricing if certain other manufacturers can drop their, keep the prices low. So as a result, uh, uh, even if uh, there were, say, you know, tariffs imposed on Chinese products, it wouldn't uh, translate to higher cost for solar panels here mm -hmm. in the U.S. Okay. Solar is actually one industry where uh, manufacturing is picking up in the U.S., uh, inverter manufacturers, uh, racking manufacturers, solar panel manufacturers are, are opening up solar cities, uh, starting a huge factory in Buffalo, New York, uh, bringing a lot of jobs to Buffalo, uh, and obviously uh, Elon Musk's b uh, big uh, battery mm -hmm. factory. Uh, so you're seeing a huge uh, renaissance of, of manufacturing uh, in, in solar in the U.S. And I read somewhere recently that Vermont is one of the highest uh, Let's see, solar jobs per capita uh, yeah. mm -hmm. of anywhere in the country. Yeah, and, and typically um, solar jobs are, and we're finding it to be the case, uh, they're jobs that are well-paying for young people. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't put myself in that category, <laughs> but, but my employees are. Oh, come on, Bill. And uh, so, so, and that's why when you had asked earlier if you know you, we might see the the tax credit disappear, what's what you're finding across the country, and especially in in coal country and and certain areas where uh, you might think the energy industry might be able to, to squash the renewable energy. There's more jobs in in solar, and so it's a jobs program. It's not an energy program, you know. So now we're starting to we've turned the corner now. Now where solar isn't just about feeling good and saving the environment, it's actually an economic engine and it's about jobs. So then it's a totally different equation. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you're starting to see um, there are the two largest wind states in the country are, 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 are Republican states, you know, Texas and Oklahoma, a huge wind um, because it's there. So. Mm -hmm. You know, renewable energy is not political. Maybe some of the credits and the, and the environmental issues people are going to make uh, political, but, but the economics of it are not. Mm. Interesting. Um, one of the questions that seems to come up a lot, or at least I hear about it, are zoning and permitting questions when, when a large solar array gets uh, proposed. I mean, we have one uh, proposed recently uh, here in, right here in Manchester for... Uh, the area down there by um, by the Batten Kill off of Union Street, where uh, uh, the town water supply is, uh, I guess, uh, a couple of hundred panels being proposed there, and um, well, that hardly became, I don't think, anyway, a kind of a, a kind of a, a sensitive hotspot. I mean, certainly we've heard a lot of, of other projects that have been proposed where, you know, neighbors kind of get a little bit, you know, up, you know, worried that uh, their view is going to be degraded in some way. Um, are those issues still kind of uh, percolating out there as front and center, or, or have we reached a point now where, uh, you know, solar farms and the, and the industry are, are at a point where 
That, that really isn't uh, quite a big of a problem. No, anymore. it's absolutely the huge part of the discussion right now. And there's legislation, you know, they, they just uh, wrote net, the net metering rules that you were talking about earlier. And part of the driving force behind the, the writing of those rules is those large, large systems that are set up in prime agriculture land. And by out-of-state investors, and they're selling the renewable energy credits out of state. And, and so the Public Service Board really was moving towards stopping that and, and, make, and, and having a disincentive to do that, whereas you give towns, towns can set up a, a preferred location where now when you do it, you're gonna get an incentive to put it on an old landfill or a gravel pit or, um, you know, a, certain areas that, that the town can designate as this is a preferred area, well then it'll be more financially viable to do it. And if you want to put in prime agriculture, then they're gonna penalize you and make it less less viable. So so part of the net metering rules changed as a result of that. And also they have a big siting discussion going on um, and, and how to classify where you know the siting, how towns can be involved in the siting issues. Right now, you know, up until now, it's been you apply for a certificate of public good from the, from the Public Service Board, and, and they deem that it is for the public good that you put in this system. Well, you gotta make sure that the neighbors are involved in the discussion, and I always tell my customers, it's really a good idea to go talk to your neighbors first. Um, and, and so uh, towns want more say in it. Uh, you're starting to see more and more towns that uh, in, or, in order for them to have a say, it has to be in their town plan. It has to be very specific language in their town plan. Uh, and some towns have screening ordinances, some towns don't. Whenever we go to uh, set up a, a system, we call the town clerk and oftentimes you hear, ah, no, we don't have any you know, there's nothing, so, so once a customer gets a certificate of public good, then the town can't say anything because the state has already said yes, we can go ahead and do that. So now you're starting to see towns working towards language in their town plan that, that will make, you know, if you want to do a solar setup, it has to comply with their wording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Manchester, if I could, um, Manchester, I'm uh, the chair of the Conservation Commission in Manchester, and we're currently working on rewriting the town plan to include verbiage like that oh, for okay. the town of Manchester so we can help you know, put solar panels where it's more appropriate for the community. Great. And one interesting thing, one interesting little side shoot of that whole thing is that what's happening is they're approaching towns and saying, you need to have specific language. Uh, and you need, to de you need to decide preferred locations. So would you prefer this location or this location? <laughs> and the towns that may not have previously even picked one are gonna go, uh, that one, okay, great. So, so now they're actually asking the towns to engage in it, whereas before it was seemed more of a passive and reactionary thing. So uh, it's gonna be interesting, That's, that will be ongoing. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, Alan, if, uh some of your talks might, might look at other kind of heating forms like geothermal energy, for instance, or, or maybe wind. Uh, is there anything that uh, will be coming up along those lines in the course of uh, the day on, the, on, the, on March 25th? Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, heating systems as well as conservation um, and insulation. So, so basically creating the, the package that can use the renewable energy. So the wind that you referred to and the solar panels are kind of the renewable energy generation portion of it. Uh, batteries would be the storage portion of it. But to, to utilize that, you need to have something like a ground source heat pump that you mentioned um, that can utilize that energy. So a ground source heat pump um, is using electricity to generate very efficient heating and cooling. And um, most of the projects that I work on nowadays are ground source heat pump projects, um, okay. you know, new homes. So very, very, uh, reliable and uh, predictable heating and cooling costs. So, so that's, again, that's something, you know, three to four times more efficient than an oil or propane furnace. So that's how you can use the renewable energy to generate enough, you know, electricity to make your house net zero. Okay. So that's certainly part of the package. Um, the statute I think you were referring to there is Act 174, as if uh, yeah. that, that business about where towns can, can pick or, or, or try to steer away uh, a prospective development uh, that they might not want. Uh, I guess I was just wondering, um, Alan, maybe can you tell us uh, how that conversation has been going so far? I mean, I remember going to a meeting 
back last December. Uh, Jim Sullivan was there talking about it, right, and right. Uh, sounded like uh, it was it was they finally found a kind of figured a way to kind of thread the needle between uh, having the state kind of say, you know, thou shalt do this, and uh, communities not being able to have a whole lot of leeway, but they will now have some. Uh, Preferred deference or something like that? Was I, I can't remember the exact term, yeah, so something I think, like that. I think we're working right now with the uh, BCRC there, working on creating uh, verbiage that they will be uh, making sure that it meets all the criteria for the state. And then once they've gone through that process, they're going to share what they've learned with the individual towns that are interested. And then we can um, make sure that our town plan is written, written with those guidelines in mind. And the BCRC, we brought up Jim Sullivan, they're really good about um, having the county energy plan and then helping each individual town either help them with something that they don't have or more narrowly focus it and, and have the exact verbiage that we're talking about. So they've been really helpful you know, in, in coordinating the, all the energy that's done at the town level. So... Um Folks then who uh, might be interested then in, in either uh, learning more about how they could uh, get a, a solar installation on their home uh, would be well advised, I guess, to come to this event then on the 25th. Will be will they be hearing about things like that or? or yeah, I think uh, anybody who's interested in discussing, um, you know, if, do they want should they weatherize their house? What steps should they do first? Uh, are they is is wind an option? Um, if they can have solar, you know, how does it work if they can't do it on their house? Uh, you know, we're going to be, th there'll be plenty of um, tables for people to get information from. Uh, what we're going to do with the panels is we will have uh, each pre presenter will talk for about 10 minutes about their particular expertise. We'll open it up for a few general questions and then we're going to break it up into smaller groups because some people may just be there for questions about wind, some may be there just for financing. And so we're not going to make them sit and wait through the discussion about wind. They can actually speak with the person who, want, who wants to talk about financing. So we're going to try and make sure that everybody has time to get the answers that they are looking for themselves. One of the things we're doing is um, the admission for the event is $5, or it's free if you bring a copy of a recent utility bill. Oh. So then while you're there, we can look at it and say, okay, you pay $150 a month worth of electricity. You know, you may be able to actually talk to the weatherization expert here and say they may be able to help bring that down. You know, as a solar installer, I'm looking at the person utility bill and trying to figure out the size of the system they need. Well, first thing is get rid of your 20-year-old refrigerator because it's using three times as much of electricity as it should. You know, so, so I do that anyway to talk with the clients. So that's what we want to do this day. Bring your electric bill. Let's talk about what your energy needs are. You know, if, like Alan said, if you're heating your house with fuel oil, well, maybe you can put you know, air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. Now you can, you're going to rely on electricity, but then you can produce the electricity. So um, that's really, uh, we called it an energy savings day because we're looking at what your whole energy portfolio of consumption is and what can we do to reduce that. So bring a, a utility bill and, and you get in for free and, and be part of the discussion. This may be an impossible question to answer, but I'll throw it out anyway because it was an experience I had many years ago about when we were looking at a, putting in a solar panel to heat our, heat our house, and uh, the payback period on it was like 20 years, and I'm thinking, whoa, uh, that's like too that long. That was 20 years, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that has changed. Oh, it couldn't even like eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, what is a typical payback period now? If someone's sitting down there and doing the math, going, okay, it's going to cost me X thousands of dollars, but this is even with the tax credits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in how many years well, would I have lower electric bills to uh, right. set that? It's dropped dramatically. It's, uh, it was uh, that high many years ago. And uh, uh, correspondingly, there were tax credits available many, many years ago as well. There were incentives available. And uh, in Vermont, we had the... Uh, Renewable Energy Research uh, Resource, Resource Center, which was the conduit for providing incentives. The incentives dropped as the solar panel prices also dropped. So uh, effect, the, the net effect is that the uh, payback has, you know, the, all the incentives dropped, the, uh, the product prices have dropped dramatically. So payback's now a lot better. Okay. So well. now you're looking at maybe seven or eight years for, uh, for homes. Okay. And uh, probably in the four to five year range for businesses, wow. they get not just the federal tax credit, they get a yeah. state tax credit as well. 
and they can enjoy accelerated depreciation. So the net effect is uh, considerably low. So, and, so and one, one thing that I, when people ask about the payback, um, what, what your investment in renewable energy is, is an investment. So rather than asking what the payback is, what's the return on your investment? And, and so when you look at that whole equation, you know, it's, it's probably a 10, 11, 12% return on your investment. So if you're spending $20,000 this year, you know, it's a 14, you get 30% back as a tax credit. So it's a $14,000 investment. Well, you're going to make $1,600 worth of electricity this year. So immediately you're going to get more than 10% return on your money. In addition to that, the value of your house goes up. Generally, they're saying probably at least $15,000. So now that investment that you just made is just added to the value of your house. So there's a lot of uh, other aspects to it. It's not just the payback. If, if you have an IRA, you don't look at what your payback is. You look at what the return on your investment is. Right, and right. right now, you can put that money, instead of putting it into an IRA, you can put it up on your roof and you'll get double digit return on your money. Mm. I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, you want to look at, uh, the, you know, the, the question that you usually ask you know, when you talk about payback is, you automatically want to push back and say, so what's the payback on your utility bill? You know, there's, there is, there's no concept Nothing. of that. It's, no. the, it's the idea that the utility bills and, and these things have become so entrenched as the, as the paradigm that, uh, you know, we are trying to displace it, but you look at it the other way. Mm. Mm. And, and I'll go one step farther. Um, I just had a, a workshop this weekend at my house, and, I, and what I'll be talking about during this day when I'm on the panel is, is storage. And so just as the, the, the photovoltaics and the price of, uh, of solar panels themselves have come down, this, the price of storage has come down. And, and what we're talking about is we're dealing with a technology. So it keeps getting more efficient and less expensive. And so now... We're at the point now where, where you can take the power that you produce during the day and use it at night. Uh, you can actually end up, you know, the money that you invest in your, in your solar and your storage is going to come back to you because you don't have to buy as much power from the utility. You're actually, it's called, they're calling it self-consumption. You produce it during the day, you use it at night. You can set up, it's an energy management system. You know, if you have a house, there's a lot of houses in the state that have rate 11, so they pay peak power, they pay 20 cents a kilowatt hour during peak hours, eight cents during off peak. Well, guess what? During the, when your time when you would be paying 20 cents, you run your house off the battery. Then when it switches over to eight cents, you charge your batteries. So it's pretty easy to do the math on that. They call it rate arbitrage. Uh, and so, so now we're talking about energy management systems. So the renewable energy isn't just about, you know, here's my investment and here's how much I'm going to make. No, right. this is, you actually control how you use it. And, and people in Vermont understand resiliency and being able to provide for themselves. And, and that's where we're at right now with the solar industry. Yeah, because I mean, one of the one of the one of the concerns about solar uh, in the past has been, well, during the winter the sun doesn't shine very much, and therefore, you know, what do we do then? Uh, I need some kind of backup plan or something, whatever. But uh, with uh, with a storage uh, unit available now, you could feed off of, I guess, power that's saved up. Is yeah, that the, the Tesla Power Wall that we've heard well, a bit yes. about? Yes. Yeah, those are uh, that's certainly an option. The uh, Power Wall Two is coming out uh, with. Uh, uh, the assistance of GMP, uh, that's, you know, that's something that uh, people could install. But to address your point about uh, lower production in the winter months, because most folks would be tied to the grid, they participate in net energy metering. So it's important that they know that any energy that's not used at any time ends up on the grid. GMP would maintain a balance of production and consumption and they would apply any excesses in the sub subsequent months. So if you have, uh, if you built up an excess in the summer months, you can apply that to, you know, the drops that you'd have in the winter months. Okay. Because unfortunately we haven't figured out a way to get more sun here in Vermont <laughs> in the winter. So. Yeah, that'd be I'm nice. sure we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out any day now. Well, uh, thank you gentlemen for being with us today. I'm, I'm sure we could talk about this for a lot longer, but we're just about out of time now. But uh, those of you who are interested in this subject uh, should circle March 25th on your calendar and make a plan to go up to the Southern Vermont Arts Center where they'll be holding forth and uh, you can bring your electric bill and sharpen the pencil and figure out which way to go here. But, uh, I want to thank uh, Bima Neda, Bill LaBerge, Alan Benoit, and thank you for all for watching. This has been uh, In Studio on GNAT TV's News Project. 
We'll see you the next time.